Well, good evening, everybody. And if you're in the fellowship hall or online, welcome to you also. So we're going to receive the tithes and offerings, and I have a confession to make. See, I've been walking with the Lord for like 40-something years now. And when I was a new Christian, do you know what part of the service I hated? This part right here. I'd sit in there, and I don't know where my daughter is, but I would um, sit in the pew in the church I was in, and then I knew they were coming to the service, and I would pinch whatever child was near me so they would cry, and then I'd have to take them out. Don't try that. Okay. But the reason I did that is because as a young Christian, there's something I didn't understand. I didn't understand the love of God, and I didn't understand his provision, and so I didn't trust him. But as I grew in my relationship with God, I began to understand that God loves us, he provides for us, and then he invites us to be a part of what he's doing. Now, if you're reading with us through our bookmark, we're actually just I'm going through Exodus. And I came to this interesting part. And it's, it's talking about when they're getting ready to build the tabernacle. And Moses calls the people. And he says, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering. And he goes through a list of things. And then about 15 verses later, Moses says, And everyone who was willing and whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord to the work for the tent of meeting. So basically, God said, I'm going to build my tabernacle. But you already have everything that's needed to build the tabernacle. And he says to us today, I want my presence to be known in the communities. I want my presence to be known in this world. And sitting right here, you already have everything that's needed for that. See, it's not about the amount that you give. It's about our heart. And God wants our heart more than he wants the resources. He uses the resources, and here's the cool thing about it. The resources God's asking for, he gave to you. He provided that. And then he says, hey, just give me a little bit of that back. And then with that, we're going to partner together, and we're going to bring my presence to a world that needs it. And so guess what? I don't hate this part of the service anymore. I actually love it. Because it's where I get to say, God, you have my heart. You have my trust. And I'm going to give to you from what you've given me. And would you make your presence known? Now, if you're visiting here for the first time, don't feel that you have to give. It's something you get to do if your heart is willing. If you're from another church, we understand your ties go there. But if you say, New Hope is my church, I want to be a part of making God's presence known. In this part of the service, we get to tell God, I trust you, and I'm going to obey. Would you bow your heads, and let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us to be a part of your kingdom, to be a part of what you are doing, and to partner with you. So, Lord God, would you receive now from what we give to you? We give it out of trust. We give it out of obedience. We say it's all yours, Lord. And would you make your presence known? We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Marsha. Yes, good evening, everyone. We want to welcome you to our Wednesday night and equip services and everyone on our live stream. Hello. I hope everyone is having a wonderful weekend. And did you guys have a fabulous weekend? Wow. Haters. Well, I did. But you know, tonight... We are, I am just, I love the fact that we get to come together as a family on our Wednesday in the middle of the week to get equipped because we are disciples. We are learners. And I was actually talking to my daughter, she's probably watching us now. Uh, I was talking to my daughter and we couldn't believe that my granddaughter is going to be a year next month. And I was like, how quickly the time went. It is almost, it's nearly the middle of February. And I was thinking, oh, that means Valentine's Day. Now, for those of you that are like, oh, okay, I actually love Valentine's Day because it is the day, the one day, that my husband cooks for me. I know. So I am always look forward to it. I love to cook, so it's not a big deal. But this one day, I get to come home, I get to relax, and I get to be fed. So I was like, oh, I'm so excited. And then right after Valentine's Day is our pause marriage conference. Now, 
it is, I think, a week and a half from today. If you haven't registered and you're married and you're thinking about, hey, is this something I want to do? Let me just tell you, my husband and I have been married for, we're going to be married for 24 years this year. Yes. And thank you. He's sitting right there. Shout out to Holy. Um, he loves when I do that. One of the things is that we've invested in our marriage every single year. We've gone to different things. We would go on date nights. We still do date nights. We have to make an investment in our marriage. And this is what the conference is. It is an investment in our, your marriage, which is the second most important relationship you have, being the first one with the Lord. So I just encourage you guys to do that. And as we are here today, we are investing. We've been talking about the four gauges, right? Spiritual gauge, emotional gauge, uh, physical gauge, and mental gauge. And this is the time where we get to say, hey, I'm coming, Lord. I'm investing um, in what you want me to do. I'm here on a Wednesday night in the middle of the week because we want what the Lord has for us. And this is where the time where we get to say, I'm going to invest and I'm going to be an active participant. Nobody wants to be a bench warmer. No one wants to be sitting on the sidelines. We get to be part of that church that is active. And that's what we get to do tonight. So I'm super excited. I commend you for being here. I commend you guys for tuning in on our live stream because are you guys ready to be activated by God's word? Yes. All right, let's pray. We welcome you, Father. We welcome you into our, this presence, Lord. We ask that you will prepare our hearts to receive your word so that we can be activated, Lord, so that we can be more than just followers. We can be disciples so that we can reach a world that is far from you. So, Lord, we thank you and we bless you during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so take out your, uh, your apps, take out your, your notes, take out your Bibles, because this is when we're going to dive into the Word. We are in a series called How Our Thoughts Shape Me. And before we get into the word, before we dive into scripture, I kind of wanted to set the tone and set the atmosphere with a few fun facts about your thoughts. And we all know how important our thought life is to the rest of our bodies. So I thought this was kind of fun, um, knowing that everything we've ever done and everything you will ever do begins with a thought. So here's some fun facts for you. Uh, your body reacts to the negative thoughts you are thinking and therefore has a direct relationship with how you feel physically. For example, when you have an angry thought, your heart may beat faster, you may start to sweat, you may even feel dizzy. All right, you ever saw someone so mad they look like they're about to explode? Yeah, or maybe that's you. Or you're getting so mad you're starting to, you turn red or you... You form a fist just to kind of keep yourself from punching someone or something. You, those are the emotions. And that all starts with that negative thought. And then it stays there and then it starts to, your body responds to that negative thought. And then those things happen. You start sweating. Some people start crying. They get so mad they, they don't know what to do. That's all beginning with that negative thought. And then your body responds that way. The second thing is, when you have a thought, your brain releases an electrical transmission that travels into your body so that you become aware of what you are thinking in a somatic way, which means it's related to your body. Therefore, a positive thought can make you feel good, and a negative thought can make you feel bad. For example, emotionally stressful thoughts may lead to headaches, muscle tensions, or stomach pains. Again, you've been in a meeting or you're, or you're at your children's parent-teacher conference or something and all of a sudden you just start going like this. Or somebody, you're talking to someone, your husband, and they just go like this. They're, you're stressing them out. That's what happens. You're, you have, your body tenses up because they're under emotional stress. Number three, it's important to question and investigate the thought that are the thoughts that are making you feel and behave in a negative way. Oftentimes, unchallenged thoughts that may actually not be true can become factual in your mind. 
Worst of all, if these are negative thoughts, they begin to pile up and generate more serious physical, emotional, and behavioral problems. Okay, so you have this thought that comes in, and if you don't take your time to question and investigate where that thought came from, what happens is even if it's not true, the longer it sits there, you begin to think that it's actually facts. It's weird how our body is. If you, start, if you don't take the time to check those thoughts and you don't take the time to kind of like, hey, where is that thought coming? Why am I thinking that? Lord, remove that thought. If we can't do that, what happens is it simmers and it stays in your thought process and it starts to become factual when in the very beginning it really wasn't facts at all. That's why some people will just believe, oh yeah, that person is like that, that person is like that, when it's not even true. Because we, we are perceiving a thought, and then instead of us questioning, instead of us checking that thought, what happens is it becomes factual in our own minds, which leads to some serious emotional health problems. Number four, since negative thoughts are so long-lasting, it takes three times the number of positive thoughts just to diminish the effects of one negative thought. It doesn't say it takes that to get rid of it. It takes three to diminish, which means it softens it just a tad. So for every negative thought, you need three or more to counter the effects of what it does on your body. And the last one is the perception of your thoughts can make you feel good or make you feel bad. But how you accept your thoughts is entirely dependent on your interpretation of them. A person can have a glass, the glass is half full versus a glass is half empty mentality. So being positive can enhance your quality of life. And research shows the positive emotions, that positive emotions can reduce inflammation that hurts your physical body. Isn't it, isn't it unbelievable how our God created us. Knowing, here we have the Apostle Paul who, who is encouraging the church and saying, hey, I need you guys to meditate and look and think and focus on things that are good. Because he knew that we are surrounded by, in a world of a lot of bad, a lot of chaos, a lot of hurt. And our physical bodies take the hit. Our physical bodies are affected by thoughts. The only weapon Satan has, the only weapon he has, is to give you a thought. That's it. He can't do anything else but give you thoughts. And when we take these thoughts and we let them ponder and we don't check them, we don't investigate where they're from and we don't take the word and we fight back. When we don't do that, what happens is we start to deteriorate physically. I think that's just amazing how that happens. And God is giving us a way to say, hey, I want you in for the long haul. I want you in the game. I want you going. I remember playing basketball and I had injured my knee. I, on the way up here, I was just talking to my mom. I said, I forgot I had three knee surgeries. I had three done. I played basketball practically my entire life. And I just wouldn't take care. I wouldn't listen. I wouldn't rest. I, I wouldn't rest long enough. The doctor's like, you need to be out for at least a month. I'm like, that is ludicrous. Ice it, wrap it up, let's go. Well, what happened was because I didn't take care of it, okay, all the inflammation, all the hurt, I didn't take care of it on the back end. I can no longer play basketball today. I know. And it's devastating. And that's how our body responds. If you do not take care of you, do not take heed to what the word is saying, damage can happen. And it's going to be hurtful. And it's very interesting that how all these things affect our physical bodies. We, take, we talk about the four gauges. And every single one of these gauges affects and impacts the other. Even if I'm fully like at the gym five times a week, I'm totally into, you know, keeping physically fit, but I neglect one of the other three, guess what? It'll affect that eventually. 
If you're not taking care of your emotional health, it will affect your spiritual health. If you're not taking care of your spiritual health, it will affect your mental health. All these things have a lot to do with what are we thinking about? What takes up our time? What takes up the space in our head? And what are we pondering on? Because if it is not the word of God, then it is not pleasing nor acceptable. Turn with me with you in your Bibles, if you have them, uh, to Philippians 4, 8. And we are going to read. And on your notes, it's, uh, yeah, 4, 8. And I'm going to read verses 8, and I'm also going to read 9, and I'll tell you why in a second. So this, is the, this has been our series scripture. Last week, Pastor Ben, ben did a phenomenal job with whatever is pure. And so this is what we're going to take a look at. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And here's verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Listen, when we focus on things that are of God, we become intentional thinkers. And when we apply those things, we become doers of God's word. So as we continue in this series, How My Thoughts Can Shape Me, tonight we're going to take a look at that part in Philippians that says, whatever is lovely. When we are able to think about whatever is lovely or what is lovely, we're able to think about the things that are pleasing and acceptable to God. But in order for us to know what is pleasing and acceptable to God, we will need to know what God detests first. I'm going to be honest. When I first saw this and I was like, oh, whatever is lovely, great, this is going to be a sweet message. And then I was like, okay, but in order for them to know what is lovely, we have to know what God detests. Okay, all right, Lord. And I just went before the Lord and I asked him, and he's like, this is my word. In order for us to be disciples, we must be hearers of the word and doers of the word. And we cannot just be always very nice and very simple, but let's bring the truth and let's have the grace. And so this is a time where we get to be, are we ready to be players in this game? Are we ready to be doers of the word? And I believe because we're here tonight, it is a yes. It's yes, Lord, use me. I am ready. And this is where we get to start taking control of our thoughts. And we get to focus on whatever is lovely. And I think to myself, have we become a feel-good generation? I just want to feel good. Have we, been, we become that generation where we no longer can tell the difference between what is acceptable and pleasing to God and what is acceptable and pleasing to the world? Have we become where we can't see that there's a difference? Trust me, what is acceptable to the world is very different than what is acceptable to God. Very different. And just because it feels good doesn't mean it's right. And if we want to be followers and doers and, and children of God and we want to stand blameless, then these are the practices we must put into our daily lives so that we can recognize. In order for me to see what is lovely, I need to recognize first what God sees as not pleasing and not acceptable. That's why it's so important for us to recognize these things so that we can start to live it out loud. See, when you hear the word, the word lovely, we think of someone or something beautiful because that's what lovely is, beautiful. And it's so easy here in Hawaii. Everything around us is beautiful. Even the people are beautiful. We have a beautiful, compassionate spirit, the Aloha spirit. There, look how beautiful our islands are they are. We're surrounded by this. So when you hear that word, it's very easy for us, but I wonder if it's easy for us to accept whatever is lovely because God is love. 
Now, don't get me wrong, God is love. But as we read in his word, I am certain that God is also capable of hate. I know some of you are like, what? This isn't very lovely. I will get to that part, I promise. God is love, yes. But God hates sin. We have to picture him as a protective father who hates anything that keeps us away from him. I'm certain that every single parent sitting in this room would do whatever it took to make sure that your child was okay. I remember when my kids first went off to college, my prayer, which seemed constant, was, God, please protect them. Please protect them. Keep them safe. Keep them safe. This is how our father is. He is a protective father. And he, he sent us his heaven's finest so that we may have the best. And he hates anything that will keep us from reconciling with him. So what is it that God hates? Turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs 6. 16 through 19, so verses 16 through 19. What keeps us from being that sweet aroma that is acceptable and pleasing to him? So I'm going to read through it, and then we'll hash it out a little bit after that, okay? This is what it says. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Ooh. Um, pretty guilty of a few of those. Uh, okay, so this is the time where we get to highlight, circle, write out, whatever it is, because looking at this, just Looking at this verse that God is telling us, I'm making it very easy for you. Here are the things that I hate. Because he hates it so much, the reason why he hates it is because it keeps us from him. And every single thing falls under one of these categories. And he's just saying, do not, do not fall into this. I'm giving you a way. I'm showing you this is what is not pleasing this is what is not acceptable. The first one is haughty eyes. So if you're taking notes, you can type that in. Haughty eyes. Pride has no room in heaven. Pride has no room in God's kingdom. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes, without, goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. In almost every instance in the Bible, as well as, as in life, pride is associated with with failure, not success. Pride keeps thousands away from Christ today, whether it's because people are too prideful to say, I need help, too prideful, too prideful to follow an unseen God, or perhaps too prideful to share that we needed, we had to need help at one point, that we still need help, or too prideful to share that what Christ has done in our lives. Jesus said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and who humbles himself will be exalted, Matthew 23, 12. The entrance to the kingdom of heaven is gained through you coming in with humility. Listen, family, humility is key, not pride. But when we come in, just like Christ, Christ the king humbled himself to show us what it was like, sacrifice for us. And we get to come into the throne room of God, not by pride, but through humility. The second one is lying tongue. Now, where did we learn to lie? Because if you ask a little kid, now I have little nieces and nephews, and I will ask them, um, where's the cookie? I don't know. Uh, why did you hit your sister? I didn't hit my I didn't hit her. Where did they learn it? I'll tell you. Human nature was warped and twisted in the fall of Adam. But Jesus, who is the truth, and I love this saying, who 
who is the truth, came saying, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 32. I love that fact that even though it seems like, okay, so how can we help it if we're born with it? Like, how can we help it? God's like, "Uh uh-uh, that's sin. That is the sin nature that is part of the flesh. I came, me, Jesus, I came, I am the truth so that you would be set free. So basically what this is saying is that I have a choice. I can either say, well, I'm born this way, but if it is not right and acceptable, acceptable to God, then what, what was, has to happen has to be a shift. If this isn't acceptable to God, then I have to choose Jesus, because in Christ Jesus I am set free, regardless of what the world is telling us is acceptable. We have a choice and, is, and to choose Jesus, and it's in Christ that we are set free. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. Now, we know the sixth commandment says, you shall not murder at Exodus twenty thirteen. What's interesting about this is that we automatically assume that it only means taking a person's life physically. But the Bible clearly says in 1 John three fifteen, whoever hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him okay there are many times i strongly disliked someone and maybe have even said i hate you a few times i just murdered someone according to god's word it's not just physically taking someone's life but also how we think about others, how we treat others. Are we loving? Are we kind? Are we really an extension of Jesus? Can we accept everyone? That's who Jesus is. Jesus accepted and loved everyone. And murder can be committed in many ways, and in one way, you can murder your spouse, your children, your friends, your neighbors, just by using poisonous words. Words are powerful weapons and should be used to uplift and speak life. Do you know if you tell a child that they are stupid long enough, this is what they will believe. They will grow up thinking and they won't be able to read, they won't be able to write, they won't be able to do anything because all they've been told was that they were stupid. If you tell someone enough that they are ugly, that's all they're going to see. See, the world has their view of what beauty is. And unfortunately, our kids are surrounded by it in social media. We are surrounded by it. And so they think, I'm never going to be good enough. Oh, I have to do this and this and this in order for me to be accepted. Because that's the world's acceptance. And that isn't pleasing to God one bit. We were created by the king himself who knows us by name. But the lies of the enemy... See, that thought that is the only power the enemy has is to give you lies. That's it. And if we start believing those lies, we're done. It not only deteriorates our body physically, but spiritually as well. Words are very, very powerful. The next one is a heart that devises wicked schemes. A thought is sown in the mind before it is reaped in the field of action. The law judges sin according to the act, but God judges us according to the evil within our hearts. See, God looks at the heart. You can be the nicest person in the world, but if you have that, that you just want nobody to succeed and all those things, God sees that. God sees that heart. Our imaginations can turn evil real quick if not careful. Evil thoughts lead us into bad habits. Bad habits lead to bondage. Bondage leads to death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. The next one is feet that are quick to rush into evil. Evil thoughts and imagination, if nourished and fed, will eventually lead to sinful actions. When we allow unchecked thoughts to linger we are feeding those thoughts. If we have a thought or imagine and we, we daydream and we, we're like, oh, it's kind of innocent and we start thinking, but then we allow it to linger where it starts to affect us, what we're doing is we're nourishing that thought. And that thought 
will turn into an evil action if not checked. That's why it's so important for us to keep our thoughts pure and keep checking, oh, where did that, no, where did that thought come from, Lord? Remove that thought from, from my head. The, the last one is a false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You know, we rarely hear of the man or the woman who slanders or gossips being corrected. In fact, we have come to think that it is a harmless thing to sow discord, in, whether it's in the office, the workplace, whether it's at home, whether it's with a group of friends, and unfortunately, at church. At what point do we think that it's okay to speak poorly of someone? At what point do we think that just because it's my opinion that it should be everyone's opinion? At what point do we, can we stop and just be, okay, how can I love? How about, how about praying? Why is everything about hurting others? We think it's so harmless. Oh, did you know so-and-so? Oh, really, I should pray for them. Right there, and you, you already know. It's, why is it that we're satisfied to hear poorly? I'll tell you why our generation or we in human nature we are satisfied with hearing that i'll tell you why it's because it's the pride in us that wants us to so that we look better people often talk slander others so that we look better than them and this is something that the lord hates ephesians 4 31 says get rid of all bitterness rage and anger brawling and slander along with every form of malice. You know, some, we're, we live in a day and age where it's so easy. Nobody's around us, and it's just we jump on Twitter. It's so easy to jump on Facebook because nobody's around us. I do, I'm just sharing my opinion. It's so easy to get caught up in all of that, and eventually what's happening is that we're allowing all of, the enemy is having a field there. Like, the enemy is just laughing at us when we give in to those practices when clearly it says the Lord hates when his children do this. Now, we look at these things that keep us from being acceptable and pleasing to God. Every single one of us deals with this. For some of us, hearing this may be hard. Perhaps God is revealing something that you're struggling with. Struggling with. Perhaps God's revealing that you know, we haven't been living a life that's acceptable and pleasing to him. This is a time where we get to say, I need your help, Lord. We're a family. We are the body of Christ, and we need to encourage one another, and I'm here to encourage you. This is the reason why we stick to the word. This is the reason why we do our devotions. This is the reason why we are encouraging one another, because every one of us falls short, and every one of us sins. And I love the fact that Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Whew, okay. So we all know that we are sinners. And then this is what God says, and then I gave you my son, Jesus. I gave you my son, Jesus. Now, whether or not you accept him, that's going to be up to you personally. But once we accept him, what we're saying is that he is not just Lord or Savior. He's not just Savior, but he's Lord as well. Is he the master? Is he the, the one that you're always like, Jesus, what do you think about this? How should I feel about this? Lord, tell me right now, how am I supposed to respond? When we start developing a very healthy, those kind of healthy habits, what, begin, what begins to happen is that our physical bodies also get to benefit from that. Health in all of those gauges that everything starts to work together. Now, knowing this makes me even more grateful for Jesus because John 10.10 10 says, I have come that they may have life. There is hope. There is hope. We see that there are things that God is not pleased with, but there is hope and there is a way, and it is through Jesus Christ. And it is through stepping into that where we get to say, okay, Lord, show me your way. 
And he says, all right, let's spend some time together in the word. I will show you how to respond. I will show you how to think. And this is the reason why Paul was so adamant. He was saying, I want you to meditate on these things. Meditate. That means ponder, spend some time, because he knew how important our thought life was going to be to the rest of our walk. So when we can, we can zone in on whatever is lovely, Lord, let me look at whatever is lovely, whatever is pure. All these things I am going to focus on that way. I don't give attention to the things that are going to deteriorate my mind and my body and my walk. Now, it's much easier to see or focus on whatever is lovely when you're surrounded by, by love. But when you're surrounded by chaos or pain or hurt, it's difficult. It's very hard. When you're in pain and you have to think of a happy place, trust me, it is easier said than done. And we have to kind of work at it. A few weeks ago, I was up in L.A. for... A meeting I had a three-day meeting and I'm used to driving on the freeways I don't mind it however um, I do dislike traffic or stalling or when people don't know how to drive at all so I have kind of like this pet peeve right like my kids will say it's road rage but I don't really think it is I don't think it is I'm not in denial I mean I don't Okay, I do yell at, I do, I do yell at cars. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. Um, but when they don't know how to drive, it bothers me. And so I'm like, I needed to be at my meeting at 8, which means I had to leave around 6.15. So I give myself half an hour, I can stop and grab a bite to eat and then grab my coffee and whatnot. And it gives me some time because I do not like arriving late. Oh, I do not like getting somewhere late. So I'm trying to take the, turn and I'm going and all of a sudden I see just red lights and I was like no I wonder how long this is going to take five minutes went by 10 minutes went by 15 minutes went by and I was like okay this is not happening so then I'm just going and I'm like okay I'm weaving in and out I'm trying to get we finally get on the freeway dead stop again and let me tell you the reason why we were stopped because in Southern California, this rarely happens. It rained. And no one in California knows how to drive when it's raining. And I was like losing my mind. And this, mind you, was after I did devotion. So of course, I was like, Lord, I'm so sorry. And God kept trying to talk to me, talk to me. He's like, calm down. I'm like, calm down. You need to part the red lights right now. <laughs> because I need to get somewhere. And he's like, why don't you look at the things that are good? I mean, we have this conversation all the time. He's like, why don't you calm down, bunny, and look at things that are good? I'm like, okay, okay, let me, let me just try this. Let me try this. And I'm looking around and nothing. I see, I see nothing, Lord. There is absolutely nothing. And he's like, try again. I'm like looking. I say, like, oh, do you see that girl? She's on her phone. I am going to die on this freeway. And you need to tell, I'm having... So all these negative thoughts, and I'm losing my mind. And if you know who I am, I am literally saying things out loud. Like, are you kidding me right now? Like, where did you get your license? Like, I need you to move. In fact, you probably should have stayed home today because I need to get somewhere. Like, I'm having these conversations. And the Lord is like, stop right now. And I was like, okay. And he's like, need you to focus. So I start singing because that's my way of just kind of getting back. I start singing praise and worship. I just start... I'm making up just praising the Lord. I'm just thanking him that I am alive. And it is freezing outside. It was like 60 degrees outside. And that was freezing. And I had the heater on. And I was like, I'm in a warm car that is, has a full tank of gas. And it's warm. I know how to drive in the rain. I'm okay. Like, calm down. And the Lord said this to me. And I actually had to write it down, and I got this. And it says, no matter where you are, if I am there, then there's something to be grateful for. And that was something lovely to me. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This statement gives us hope because it's telling us that 
There is a way to be transformed. There is a way, and his name is Jesus. This is why it's so important to to be in the word every single day. It gives us the power and fuel to overcome the daily struggles of sin. It allows the word to grow and become established within our hearts, giving us the ability to rightfully see and understand all that is lovely. You can go ahead and put away your notes and your Bibles. Glenn can come out to the piano. Watching a baby being born, to me, is probably the most, one of the most extraordinary things and experiences in all of life. <laughs> to see that this little human takes its first breath and cries. And how amazing our God created us to, so that we could be part of that creation. He included us, his children, to be part of that reproducing humans. And when my granddaughter was born, she was literally the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And instantly, I was filled with love. I was filled with all these feelings. But I could never imagine that I could love someone like this, like that much, so quickly. And it makes me think that when I think of on, about things that are lovely and I ponder and I spend time thinking about life and all the good that fills it, I stand in awe knowing that our God knew all of this chaos was going to surround us. But he gave us a way to live a right, righteous life. That he gave us a way that we could stand before him and be that pleasing and acceptable sweet aroma. That he didn't just leave us stranded and say, well, here's my list. Either you do it or you don't. No. God's compassion and God's grace is what a moved him and prompted him to send us heaven's finest. And that was Jesus. And sometimes we can get discouraged thinking, wow, that's a lot. And I fall into that, so no sense, because I'm always sitting. That, my friend, is another lie from the enemy. He wants you to believe that you can't do it. He wants you to believe that you are not enough that you are unworthy and unvaluable. He wants you to think that maybe it wasn't you that God's talking about, somebody else. Put him in check. Put the enemy in check. Be mindful of the things that you, you look at, that you think upon, that you dream about. So have a clear sense, knowing all these things is no longer acceptable. So that I can now say when I'm in a situation and I'm having a tough time, and yes, it would take me a little bit to get in there as long as I get back. Because having an unrighteous attitude or having that kind of behavior is unacceptable. And when you hear God speak, Listen, he's bringing you back. He's bringing you back. And as long as we get back, then we're okay. All right, Lord. Reset. You can do this again. And his mercies are new every morning. We serve that kind of God. You know, we're monitoring our, our gauges. Spend time writing those out. Like, where am I spiritually? How am I doing spiritually? What about my emotions? Am I getting angry too quickly? Am I becoming too sensitive for certain things? Like, where am I emotionally? And Lord, what about my thought process? What about the, my thinking? Where am I mentally? Where am I physically? Am I doing the things that 
I need to be doing so that I can go the long haul. I don't know about you, but God did not create bench warmers. He created players. And there's an enemy out there that thinks that he can win. But we already won. We're already champions. And we get to walk in that freedom. We have been set free because of who Jesus is. And although God hates sin, he is a good and compassionate and loving Father. Let's pray. Most heavenly and gracious God, we thank you above all things. We thank you that you have given us an opportunity, Lord, this roadmap to follow. You have given us instructions as you equip us, your saints, your children, that we are those disciples. We want to learn. We want to understand and we want to apply your word to our daily living so that we can be pleasing and acceptable to you. Thank you for sending us heaven's best. And thank you for giving us that opportunity to say yes to Jesus, not only as our Savior, but as our Lord. And although we live in a world that is surrounded by chaos and filled with hurt and pain and sin, you give us a way to think and ponder and meditate on the things that are lovely. So, Father, send your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Encourage us, Lord. Strengthen us as we go out and we live life. May we always be reminded who you are, who you have called us to be, and that you have set us free from sin, that we are no longer held captive, but we have been set free and we are overcome because of your son, Jesus. We thank you so very much for all these things and for the life that we get to live surrounded by beauty. And may we be reminded to always look at that. We thank you again in Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen.